welcome to today's webinar, an introduction to SDL Trillion Docs 13, Service Pack 1 and the new publishing pipeline. My name is Kate and I'll be your host. Today's webinar we expect to last for about 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you have any questions during this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box, which you can find in the Ask a Question tab. I'm now going to pass you over to Frank to begin the webinar. <clears throat> Thanks, Kate. <clears throat> Just as a quick introduction, so my name is Frank Lossett. Um, I'm head of R&D for Trillion DX, so that basically means for Trillion Sites and Trillion Docs, so two, two of the products that we have in our portfolio. And we also have, together with me, Erwin Lefebvre. Hi, I'm Erwin Lefebvre. I'm a senior developer, and I'm working from SDL Mechelen in Belgium. Okay. So the goal of this presentation is to give you a quick rundown uh, to, through all the features that we have delivered for uh, Trillion Doc 13 and the SP1 release that just came out uh, today. Um, next, Urban will go into a bit more technical session, and he will explain uh, all the things that we have done for the publishing overhaul uh, in, in our system. So first of all, Dynamic Experience Delivery and DXA. So typically, uh, content is still created in, in different silos in, in, in an organization. So you have marketing, uh, you have support, so you might have e-commerce uh, available. But what we can clearly saw is that most of the content is most, mostly not orchestrated throughout the entire organization. So it made it basically very difficult to find the right answer uh, when, once you got, got to the website. Now, you, you have to orchestrate all those pieces uh, into something like one unified ecosystem uh, because, well, you want to make sure that the, the experience that the customer is getting uh, is, is, is continuous, right? They just don't go to the support pages or they don't want only look at the marketing content, but they will touch all, all those areas on, on your live website. Uh, so, for example, when a user is making a buying decision, um, they might be looking for support content that is available because the technical information in, in there might be a make or break uh, for, for making their decision. On the other hand side, if someone is a long-term customer, uh, they might be going to the support side because they have some issues with the product. But, of course, you as an organization also would like to uh, sell more to that customer. So there needs to be some kind of a touch point with, with the marketing. Now, on the delivery side, it, it's not different. So also we were doing basically the same thing. We had two different delivery solutions, uh, one for Trillion Sites and one for Trillion Docs, which we called Live Content Reach at the time. But this is basically what we have changed in, in the uh, Trillion Docs 13 release. So the future state brings us close together. Um, and that, for that reason, we're, we're basically uh, introducing Dynamic Experience Delivery Platform. Uh, which is basically a delivery platform that spans both the Trillion Sites and the Trillion Docs um, content management systems. There is one more note that I need to make. Um, that is that basically Trillion Docs is already using this delivery platform uh, at this moment in time. For Trillion Sites, we will have to wait until the beginning of November uh, in, in 2018. But from that time onwards, you can really start blending the experience between pre-sales and between post-sales uh, information and, and documentation. That brings us to the next thing. So we have built something what we call DXA uh, for dynamic documentation. And DXA stands for Digital Experience Accelerator. Uh, because what we saw is typically if you want to implement like a support portal or a documentation portal, it, it was always long and costly. And therefore, as you has put in substantial effort uh, basically to remove this hurdle for you. Um, to accomplish this, Trillion Docs, uh, we, we ship now with a DXA for dynamic documentation, which is basically a documentation portal, which has a number of different features included in that one. Uh, and it's basically a best practice implementation on, on how you can get your documentation online. Uh, it provides you like a framework so that you can build out your experience rather quickly. Yeah? Um, one thing to mention here is that SDL provides the DXA in both the Java uh, flavor and in a .NET flavor. Now, if I look at the basic high-level overview, <coughs> so it's a documentation portal. 
Um, it's easy to customize, so if you have additional functionality you would like to add to it, if you would like to integrate it with other systems, with other sites, it's pretty, pretty easy. Um, we have made it mobile friendly, and it's a responsive design from the start. Uh, you can have multiple releases of your documentation online at the same moment in time, which is pretty important because most of the product companies out there will have multiple releases of their product in the field. And for that reason, it's also important that you can guide your uh, customers to write to, to towards the right version of your documentation as well. Um, <clears throat> in terms of a quick run through through all the different features in there, of course, there is uh, navigation. Um, you have multiple levels of navigation. So in the out-of-the-box product, we, we have built in like a simple taxonomy based on uh, product family and product releases so that you can navigate uh, the sites uh, going through a product family and then to a certain product release, a product version, uh, and whatsoever. Um, as I said before, you can have multiple product le releases live in the field, so you can also navigate those. And, but that is typically how it will not work, right? Because most of the bigger companies out there, they will have an enterprise-wide taxonomy management system, which is basically driving the navigation on their corporate website. So it's pretty easy to link the taxonomy management uh, system into, into this experience as well. Since we are SDL, um, uh, language is basically in our DNA. Um, um, the site is multilingual from the start. So the user interface has been localized in a number of different languages, uh, just a handful, but if you want to extend that, that is pretty easy. Um, we are supporting right to left uh, support. And also we have the concept of fallback languages. So that basically means that if you're looking at, at the site, and uh, for example, if your document is not available in your language, then we have the ability to fall through, through a default language, typically English, but that, that is also configurable uh, in, into the system. Um, in terms of personalization, uh, because it's called dynamic documentation for a reason, um, so in Trillion Docs, the people that know Trillion Docs were pretty good at personalizing documentation. Um, so we have included a simple UI where you can express basically uh, the information that you want to see, uh, the features that you want to see. For example, if you're a software development company, you could indicate in this screen that you're just interested in .NET examples or .NET codes uh, in, in the documentation. Um, so a simple UI has been provided where you can express what you want to see, but if you, if you in a real life scenario, um, basically these things might come through a UI so that where, where users can set a limited number of, of properties, but we are also able to integrate the entire thing with external systems like a PLM system, a customer relationship management system so that we can figure out, okay, who is the user, which is the product that he bought, which are the features that were installed on, on his product, and based on all that information, we can personalize the documentation uh, on, on the fly. In, on this slide, you can see ambient data framework, and basically that's a technical term on how to accomplish that. So it's easy to build a cartridge, to build a connection to an external system, to get the right context in, and then to personalize it uh, on the fly. Of course, there is also a search uh, available. Uh, it's based on Elasticsearch. Um, uh, it, it's a pretty simple search at this moment in time, but we have all the ingredients to extend the search as well. So all the data, uh, it, it's fully multilingual search as well. Uh, all the metadata are being indexed. So, for example, if you would like to extend this out-of-the-box reference implementation with, uh, like, a faceted search, that is pretty easy as well. Now, DXA is something that we will start open sourcing as well. So we will continue to, to build on top of that. We will add new features to it. So faceted search will appear in, in, in the out-of-the-box uh, implementation very soon as well. Um, lastly, uh, we have also built it in such a way that you can have it indexed by the, the popular search engines like Google, like Bing, um, um, so all that stuff is available. Something that we have added in SP1, and here at the top of the page you can see the reference to Trillion Docs SP1, is that we also have um, provided the capability for end users so the users of your documentation to provide feedback on, on the documentation. Um, so 
so it's pretty easy. If if you have a comment, if you would like to improve, if you don't get what the documentation is saying, well, you can leave a simple comment on there. And the good thing about that is that it will flow back through the technical documentation team, right? So the technical documentation team, which is also something which is new, will have a customer feedback dashboard. Um, so they will see all the comments from their end users coming in here. Uh, you can filter. You can filter by date. You can filter on which are the documents uh, in which the comments are, are being made. But you can also reply to the customer back to the customer, right? Because it it is it, it, it's pretty frustrating if you want to improve the documentation as a customer and if you provide feedback but you never hear back from from the company anymore, right? So in this case, we are providing like a uh, a, a round loop, uh, so, so that at least if the customer is providing feedback, that you will have the ability to just to respond to it, to engage in a, in, in a conversation with the customer, and at the end of the day, um, um, to, to improve your documentation. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> we also made some quite quite some improvements to Collaborative Review, our Collaborative Review, review platform. Some are pretty small, like for example, we are respecting the security settings as they are defined in, in the content manager. Um, we have made some editorial improvements in our online editor. But I think the biggest things that we have added are these. So basically, we are providing a better overview for customers on the things, uh, on the SMEs, what, what they would have to contribute on, uh, the things that they need to review. Uh, in the previous version, people had to send an email, they had to say, well, okay, these are the pages you need to look at, or we are expecting you to look at or contribute to these pages. But from a usability point of view, that was not always ideal. Um, so today we are providing uh, our users with a list of pages that they need to review, and they can simply click uh, on the pages, and it will bring you to the right location in context of the right publication so that they can start reviewing the contents. Um, so of course, here you could make some small changes, some small tweaks. Uh, you can provide comments, uh, for, for example. But you can also approve the page at this moment in time and progress that page into the workflow that you have defined for, for your company. Second big thing that we have added is that you from this moment in time, you can start adding new topics. So if you are modifying or if you're um, uh, creating a new table of contents, for example, before you had to jump through a lot of hoops to, to get basically a new topic in, in there, right? You had to go to the content manager, you had to create a new, 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 uh, a, a new page, and then you had to go back to your editor, and then you can start using it. At this moment in time, we have changed it in this way, that you can simply say, I would like to insert a new topic. Um, you will be able to select a template from which you want to start with. Then you have the option to provide the mandatory metadata, but there is also an option to see all the metadata. So if you would like to add more color to it, if you want to uh, tag your content appropriately, that, that it will be possible as well, because you will have access to all the metadata that is available in the system. And the last thing that we have added is basically the capability that from the online editor that we have available, that you can also start uh, inserting new images. Before, you could only um, basically use uh, images that were already uploaded and pre-approved in the system, um, but that did not work for all the SMEs because the SMEs are writing a piece of text, they're documenting something, they want to take a screenshot, and they would like to upload that directly in their XML editor. Um, so at this moment in time, you can just use simple drag and drop to the right location in the repository, and the image will be uploaded, and then you can start using it right away. Also, you can also change existing images. So in this screenshot, for example, you can see uh, a seat of a car. So if, for example, that would be the wrong version or there's something wrong with that, um, there is a replace image button at this moment in time where you can simply select a new image and upload that new image into your repository. And then some enhanced productivity uh, things. I think this one was the major one for the SP1 release. Um, we have done a complete overhaul of the publishing pipeline. And I think the team has done a tremendous effort 
to, to get this done, but also what we have achieved in terms of performance is basically mind-blowing at this moment in time. Um, so we have optimized the entire publishing chain. For example, we're only exporting uh, the stuff that needs to be exported. So for example, if through personalization, some pieces or some chapters didn't apply, before we were just exporting everything, at this moment in time we will skip it and we will, won't just export that. Um, other thing that we have done is, uh, at this moment in time, it's, uh, the export will be done in multi-threading, so, so that at least you can take advantage of the compute power that you will have available. Um, now, if you look at these slides, and of course, there need, always needs to be a disclaimer when you show performance numbers. So it always depends on the hardware that you're using, um, uh, the data complexity that you, you are having. So, for example, if you have, have a document that is basically using 7 million COM reps, of course, the performance will not be like, like this because the data is more complex. Now, the test that we have done is basically with 5,000 files, 25,000 files, and 60,000 files. Um, and what you can see is with 5,000 files, the performance is basically two times faster. So in this case, we were going from 22 minutes to 12 minutes. Uh, for 25,000 files, it is going three times faster. And for 65,000 files, it's basically nine times faster. So from 23 hours to only two hours. So I think in terms of performance, and this is basically one of a very good reason to consider an upgrade to the SP1 release is that we have done major effort to, to overhaul the publishing and also to get the um, uh, performance way better than it used to be. Then the translation integration improvements. Um, so in our previous integration with World Server and TMS, we were getting some complaints from our customers, and, and just because we listen to our customers, we have been tackling those in, in the Trillion Box 13 release as well. So before, uh, we were basically not properly synchronizing the workflow statuses between the two systems. So for example, when you were canceling a job in TMS or in World Server, um, we were not canceling that job in KC or, or in, Trillion, in Trillion Docs. Right? So we are making sure that whatever you do in whatever system, that the workflow statuses are reflected and the, the system will always be uh, in sync with, with each other. The other thing, for example, when in, in the previous version, when you were canceling a job in, for example, World Server, then we were not resetting the status of the individual topics, and they were still in, in the status called in translation. And then people were getting basically the false expression, uh, impression that, that the, the, the topics or the files were still uh, being translated in a TMS, which was not true. Um, the other thing that we have included in this is that we have included re a review stage as well. Uh, so that basically means that you can send your stuff to the translator, they will translate it, but we will intermediately get the content, although it's not being updated in the translation memory yet. We will retrieve it anyway so that you can start publishing that out uh, so that your sales organizations might uh, do a linguistic review or a, a review on accuracy on, on the translations and so on. And once the translations are approved, um, basically everything will be committed into the translation memory and, and, and the final publication in that language can go out. And then the last one, <clears throat> it's a smaller one, but I think it has a big impact on our end users. Um, because at this moment in time, you can define your own views in, into the system. Before, you will always have to go to our PS team. Uh, just for a simple change, uh, you had to re request to, to add like a metadata field in the list view. Um, then you had to do an upgrade. So this was all taking too, too, too much time. And what we're looking at at this moment in time is basically to get more control in terms of configuration to the user. So for example, on those list views, you can basically decide what is visible, and that can be different for every user, where before it was, uh, the definition was always the same for all the users in the system. Uh, but you can also have make decisions on which are the columns that are visible. You can reorder the columns, and we will persist that. If you change the column widths of your list views, we will persist that as well. 
um, also the sorting order of the columns. All those things will be persisted and will be user specific, right? So I think this is a quite small improvement, but I think the impact on, on our end users uh, is basically massive. And then a few technical upgrades. <clears throat> I will not go into too much details, um, but we have spent a lot of time on centralizing configuration. Reason being because we want to make it way easier to do upgrades in, in, in the past. We have spent a lot of time on uh, automating the upgrade process. Uh, we will also do some webinars on, on that real soon. Um, we have simplified the installers so from 34 parameters. Uh, we reduced it to only six. Uh, we merged different tools that we had, uh, technical tools, into one tool to make it more transparent and more easy to use. Uh, and then that's an important one, and we will also schedule a separate webinar on that one, is PowerShell Automation Toolkit. Um, so we have developed four PowerShell Automation Toolkits uh, just so that you can start automating stuff on our system using PowerShell. Now, automation is the future. If you deny that, well, that, that's not a good thing right? because you can do a lot of things with, with those automation toolkits. For example, if you would like to have a nightly publish of your documentation, you can automate that. If you would like to get some reports uh, on, 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 on for, for example, some custom reports, you can use those uh, toolkits just to get extract the right data from the system and then, for example, put it into <coughs> Elasticsearch and use Kibana to do some data mining on top of it. So the PowerShell Automation Toolkits are a pretty powerful tool that will enable you to do whatever with the system uh, what you need to do uh, in terms of automation. Then 64-bit support for the desktop tools. Um, so we have changed from 32-bit to 64-bit. Um, it was long overdue, but finally we got, got to it. Um, <clears throat> so everything is 64-bit right now. And then we have also added Java 10 support. In terms of authoring tools, we have also upgraded all the authoring tools to the latest version, uh, which is basically Oxygen 20. Um, we are supporting Arbitex Editor 7.1 uh, again, and then XMetal 12 and 12J is supported. Unfortunately, XMetal just before the release came out with an XMetal 13. So this is not yet into the product, and this is something that we need to put on our backlogs uh, so that we can deliver that um, later on. Now, 64-bit support has some advantages. So, for example, um, we had customers that were trying to import like millions of topics into the system, and they were running out of memory uh, because the, the volume of the files they were trying to import was so huge. Now, with 64-bit support, we will have more memory space available, and, 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 and those things will, will uh, go smoother in the future. Now I will give the word to Erwin. Um, this will be slightly more technical um, because we have done the overhaul of the publishing pipeline, but we also would like to give the opportunity or give a bit more explanation on what has changed on a technical level because we also have partners online uh, that, that need to know the impact and that also need to know how to move forward uh, in the future. So by this, I will give the podium to Erwin. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Uh, so hi, everyone. So yeah, I will give you a bit more insight on, on what we did to achieve that uh, publishing performance and more about the overhaul we did there. So, well, actually what happens when a user publishes a publication output, uh, he actually puts, well, the process doesn't start right away. He puts it on an asynchronous queue, the background task queue. So he actually triggers a published background task, which will be um, handled by the background task service when, when that service has time. So, and, and in that process, we see two big phases, mainly the export phase, which exports all the objects referenced by the publication from the database to the file system. And the second stage, the, the post-process phase, which actually transforms those exported files, which are like XML files or images, to the final format. So, well, the final format being either PDF or CHM, 
or it could also be that we upload um, the result into the into collaborative review or into the dynamic delivery platform. So in order to do that, well, if we look at, at the information that the user sends in that publication output, we see that um, he actually defines what the output format needs to be, like PDF or CHM. He also, um, in the publication, he also defines which versions of the objects he wants. He also checks which languages or which fallback languages uh, he wants to use to publish the information. So for example, if um, not all of the topics are translated, um, the system will fall back to a fallback language in order that the, the, well, the end user can, for example, already see the English content when uh, the French topic is not available yet. Another thing he passes along is the condition context and the variable definitions. But, well, an important thing is also the root map, which defines the entire structure of your publication. So if we then look at, at what happens in the export process, we, we use that information that uh, the user passes along um, to determine the correct versions of the objects we need to export, we also determine the, the topics that were referenced from the root map or, or uh, sub root maps or sorry sub maps that still contain other topics underneath it. So well, it's kind of a hierarchical structure that that we can follow. So we also well there are a lot of other things that need to happen in the export process. So filtering conditions, exporting metadata. Um, well, we'll go into more detail for that later. So in the post process, mainly what happens is that we, well, depending on, on which output formats, um, if it's an output format that uses DITA OT, we prepare the files for DITA OT, uh, then we run DITA OT, and then we uh, optionally run some publishing engine like Antenna House. For example, for PDF, we would uh, run Antenna House. Um, and um, yeah, if we upload, in, in some cases, um, we do a transformation steps and then upload uh, content to, uh, to a secondary database like uh, collaborative review or dynamic delivery. So what we actually did was we, we did a complete overhaul of the entire process. So we uh, the entire export process um, is written in .NET now, and we, for the post process, we stepped away from the VB6 scripting and are now using .NET plugins. So again, here, a bit more detail on what we do. So actually, during the export, we take the content from the database and we export it into the file system. So important here is that we now use multiple threads. So in this case, for example, one would be the root map. And then while we export the root map, we also process it to see which uh, links are inside the root map. So um, we actually first do the conditional filtering of that map and then follow the links that remain after conditional filtering to see which topics or which ship maps we still need to export. So that actually makes sure that, uh, that we only export what is, uh, what is needed. So in the second stage, where the post-process stage, we have a number of plugins. So there are a few different types of plugins, so the most used ones are, are the sequence plugins, so what we just call the publish post-process plugins. Um, important there is that uh, that are plugins that, uh, well, the, our main goal in the plugins that, or our main definition is that one plugin does one specific task. So in order to uh, do the same as the scripting did before, we use a sequence uh, of plugins to accomplish the same thing. So this would make it easier to, to add an additional plugin, which can be custom, 
uh, without uh, needing to go to the entire script to, to see where you need to put it. So, um, well, those plugins would be responsible to prepare the files or run data OT or upload uh, the resulting files back to the repository. So all those things are now expressed by plugins. Um, then we have also two different other kinds of plugins, mainly the compare plugin, which is mainly used if you want to compare um, or if you do a publish of a publication output which um, allows for comparison between different versions of a publication. So that plugin will be used to, to provide some comparison, comparison files as an end result, which then will be the input of the, of the other plugins. And the second thing that you can optionally configure is a combined plugin. So if you uh, publish to uh, a format that allows to combine multiple languages in one output, uh, for example, like the ish PDF, then uh, that plugin is responsible to, uh, to create a root map and actually uh, refer to all the different language maps in order to, to get them into one publication output. Okay, so the main lines or the main highlights of what has changed. So before in the, in the published service, we used the baseline structure. So um, that meant that sometimes we exported more than, than we actually needed because uh, we exported the files and then we uh, started to do conditional filtering. So now we really follow the map structure. So every time, um, for example, a map is exported, we first conditionally, conditionally filter it, and then we um, follow the link statements that remain to, uh, to also export the children of that map. Whether it's a sub map or a topic, um, we just follow the entire structure. So before we also didn't do anything with the href or conref attribute, so we just left the GUIDs that were there in place. Uh, in the new one, we immediately replaced those with the actual file names as they uh, are exported to the file system. In the old one, we also um, kept the DTDs into the XML files and did some uh, validation and link and hyperlink extraction. And we actually also checked that those links and hyperlinks were uh, uh, published as well or part of the publication. So that's also something we changed. We now, um, during the, the exporting phase, uh, removed the DTD. We actually still for six still store it in a, in a processing instruction so we could always get it back. Um, the reason for that is that uh, loading the files with DTD is rather slow. So, if we want to, um, well, want to have the necessary performance uh, every time we load files again, for example, in plugins, we would avoid loading uh, the file with the DTD again. So that's the main reason for it. Um, also, here we don't uh, we do hyperlink validation for XML validation and we, the actual checking of the links and hyperlinks, whether they land in, in the final publication uh, is actually checked by a plugin. So then for performance, we are uh, using four, by default four threads now, so four CPU cores instead of just one. So, well, this is, is actually the reason uh, for the major in performance improvements for the majority of the performance improvements. Um, so mainly on the export phase, we, we gain a lot of, uh, of speed. And then, yeah, depending on uh, missing objects, so for example, if you prepared an, uh, or added an extra topic uh, to your map in the publication, but you didn't have time to write it yet, uh, we before um, created separate files for every single object that didn't exist. And now we just create one and we refer to from every place where we didn't, um, well, for every topic that didn't exist, we 
link it to the same missing object uh, placeholder. So for the post-processing phase, before it was Phoebe script based, so it did some replacement of the GUIDs, it's massaging some of the XML, running Dita OT, so also here the performance was um, limited to using one thread. So now we um, do the same with uh, compiled.NET plugins. So um, main thing here is that we also can use multiple threads inside, uh, inside one plugin. So also um, optionally, as I said before, the, the export removes the DTD and adds some default attributes that are defined into DTD, persist them in the XML that is exported. So here we uh, actually have plugins that can optionally restore the DTD back or remove those default DTD attributes again. Also, uh, we removed some of the output format options because actually they're now, um, it depends on how, if you, for example, want to zip the result, it's actually a matter of configuring a zip plugin and not um, an option on the output format anymore. So there's no need to use that single file uh, output format option anymore. So how do we configure this? Um, so the publish is now one publish background task. So before it was like exports for publication, which in turn then triggered publish service process or something. So now we have one publish event, um, which also makes it possible to use the same, to do uh, retries on certain error messages. So depending on the error number, you can uh, do retries and then say how long you want to wait before the, between the retries. Um, and well, we also have three different event types uh, because while, while the error numbers depend a bit on, on the, the published action you are going to take. So for example, if you publish to dynamic delivery or to collaborative review, you would actually get other error messages because they're uploading to a second system and well, the connection can break or there can be some uh, things that you want to retry on, on certain error messages. So that's why we split them from the regular publish uh, event type. So another thing we did is we uh, made sure that all of the configuration is in the XML published plugin settings, which you can access from, from the web client. So before we have some separate files on the file system where you can define which metadata you wanted to export uh, for your topics or your maps um, or for your publication. So now that's all uh, part of the XML published plugin configuration. Another thing you can see there is the, is the sequence of plugins. So you see, for example, that depending on the output format, you can have a different sequence of plugins. So you see there that um, we reference a certain plugin which um, is responsible for removing uh, enough titles which are not locked in the in the map files. We do some checking of reference. You see some upload uh, plugins there of the results. Um, so those are, well, depending on which output format you're publishing, you can specify other um, plugins to run there. So you see that they're referenced, but the actual reference um, we will see later that there's also a definition, so you can reuse the same plugin definition for different output formats. So before I said there were different types of plugins, so in, in most cases you only need the, a sequence of plugins, so the regular post-process plugins, but there are some uh, output formats like HPDF 
which allows you to combine multiple um, languages into one output or to um, get uh, a, an output that uh, has changed marks to indicate which uh, which text was uh, added or removed between the two different versions of a publication. So for that, we have uh, different types of plugins. So for example, here in the before compare plugins, the com before compare plugins would allow you to um, allow removing content that is not important for the comparison. So for example, you see there that we remove the navigation titles which are not locked in the map because otherwise they would indicate uh, a change while uh, those navigation titles should not be taken into account or are not taken into account by Tita OT. So the second part is that, well, those before compare plugins, they're actually new. We, we never had something similar like that. So they actually can run on the old version or the new version or both. So you can define uh, some plugins that only run on the the old version of the publication or only on the new version of the publication. So the compare plugin actually makes it possible to, to uh, it, the input is actually two XML files, so the old version of the topic, for example, and the new version of the topic. And then we, out of the box, use uh, the change tracker component to uh, provide um, change tracker markings, which then can later be picked up by the data OT and uh, the style sheets there to uh, add the proper uh, removal or um, add the addition blocks into the into the PDF output. And the combined plugin um, actually uh, makes it possible to combine multiple languages into one data map. So normally we have, if you export with multiple languages, you would end up with three different folders with one language, but with for every language one folder. So this one would create one additional root map with, which uh, would link to those uh, to the maps in those three uh, language folders. So important for the compare plugin is that, well, in theory you can also, well, not in theory, but you could also create your own custom plugin that would uh, well, implement the way you do the, the try or the change uh, detect the changes with, for example, data XML. And as I said before, in the, in the sequence, we actually refer to uh, a definition file. So the name that you refer to in, in the post-published plugins, we actually have the definitions uh, at the bottom of the, at the bottom of the configuration file. Um, so, well, all those plugins are actually also documented, the out-of-the-box ones, so you can find them in the documentation. So, well, if we look at the architecture in detail, I will not go to the, through the entire slide anymore. Just an indication that there's a lot happening in the publish. So, you see that we have uh, different, here you also see the different parts. So for example, in the initialization, we, we set the status to publishing to avoid that if you have multiple servers or multiple background task services running, that uh, the publish is not picked up by more than one machine. Um, you see the, well, the things that happen during an export, well, these are only the, well, Still only the big things. I think there's a lot more happening here, but we only wanted to, to show uh, the highlights of it. So, um, well, you see also that you can define the different types of plugins. So as I said before, mainly most of the output formats only use the, the regular post-process plugins but some of them can use the before compare, uh, the compare of the com or the combined uh, language plugins. 
So um, if we look at how we deal with um, the publishing in the event log, so to indicate, we, we you can see that, um, well, if you go to the event uh, details in the web client or the event log in the, in the web client, you can see what actually happens for a publish. Um, it's similar as we had before, but there are some, uh, some changes to it. So you see that determining versions and language objects to export, you also see exporting content objects by depth using multiple threads. So um, if I go a bit further, you can actually see that um, we publish or we export the files uh, in, in different depths. Um, so depending on the depth, uh, well, every depth can uh, use multiple threads. So well, for the root object, that doesn't really make sense. But if you go for depth one or depth two, we can uh, we use multiple threads to export the files there. So if you look at the examples, it's only three files. But of course, in, in practice, it's uh, a lot more. So also um, important to know is that uh, since we allow for conditional filtering in the plugin configuration, as you saw with uh, that we um, we used conditions to to say for which output format we want to run which plugins, it's important uh, that you know which plugins still run or not. So uh, we first list the number of plugins and then we actually log all of every single plugin that is uh, executed. Another thing that's important is that, well, in 90% of, of the cases, the reason for a failure you can find in those two lines. So if you look at uh, the command output or the data OT log file, in most cases, um, you will find an, an error or a reason why the publish failed in, in those two lines. So then we, well, what if you want to build your own plugin? Um, we currently require Visual Studio. Uh, we also, you also need the .NET for framework. And then you need access to uh, our plugin DLL. Um, so this is actually quite similar to if you wanted to make a write plugin, uh, you also need the same, uh, the same uh, environment for that. So, well, as I, before, um, so we have the different versions of plugins, so all have their own uh, plugin interface, so if you implement those interfaces, you can implement a different type of plugins. So we also have a list of all the items that are exported so that you can use to obtain information for it, like uh, the metadata or that uh, the file name for where it's exported, those, those kind of information. Uh, would you want to do some, some changes of the file or something? So another thing you can also see is that, that uh, if a publish export fails, there's a file that is kept on the server, which allows you to, um, to run the plugins again. So um, actually, we use two folders. We uh, normally export to an export folder on the server, but every time we start the plugins, we all copy all those files from the export folders to a work folder. So that makes it possible to, to run the same plugins again or to, uh, to uh, use a specific sequence of plugins by changing the plugin configuration that is uh, also exported as well. So let's say you have a problem with uh, plugin number seven you could actually configure only the first six plugins, then see what uh, that those plugins did on the file system and, and start from there to analyze what could be the cause of, of, your, uh, of the failure. Okay, <clears throat> thanks everyone.
Just a brief mention here that we can all continue the discussion on our community sites. Um, and there is a specific area for the docs events also so that you can be kept up to date on the webinars that we're doing, the events that we're, we're doing, and, and so forth. So go to uh, community.sdl.com. Um, very good source of information. Uh, other things you can do on the community side is post new IDs that need to go into the product so that the community can start working, can put votes on, on there. So the community side is a pretty good resource for um, uh, more information on our products. Um, that's about it. <clears throat> I'm looking for questions. Um, so as Kate said in the beginning, if you have questions, now is the time. Uh, post them into the chat window, uh, and then we can answer them. If not, we can call this webinar and So Kate, there are no questions. No, it doesn't look like we've got any questions today. Um, just to let everybody know, there will be a recording of this actually posted on the community, um, and we will be emailing out a link to the recording anyway after today's webinar. Thank you. Okay, so thanks Frank and Owen for presenting today, and thank you for attending our webinar. We hope you found today's session useful, and we look forward to seeing you again on one of our next webinars. Uh, hang on. Oh, <laughs> I think we've just question. got a question come in, haven't we? Are the old VBS scripts still supported? Well, we actually removed the the VBS scripts that were there before, and well, the idea is that you go to the new uh, plugins, which would allow you to to get the performance enhancements we were talking about. Yeah. Now there is one workaround I can think of about this moment in time is that you basically create your own custom plugin, which launches your old VBS scripts. So that will still work, but then of mm -hmm. course you're losing the purpose of, of uh, and you will not be getting all the performance improvements. But that can help you forward. So another question, if all the objects in the publication are for conditional filtering fit the criteria for a release candidate, would the publication go to that state, even the object that were filtered out may not be released? No, that, that is still an issue that we have in, in, in the product, uh, because that's not just on the publishing side. That is more on the process that is basically taking care of the releasing and the freezing of the baselines. Um, that is still high on our list, but it's not included in the SP1 release. More questions? No more questions. So I would like to thank everyone. And as Kate said, we will make this recording available to everyone. So I wish you a good night, good, good evening, good morning, wherever you are, and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.